to you about sand and why sand is important, not only sand itself, but substitutes to sand and how we came about discovering them. Sand is important not only because it's beautiful, but I hope to tell you how I discovered this sand is my sand and how I hope that you will discover that actually the sand is our sand because it's so beautiful among other things but it's also so useful in what it does for us and how it contributes to our entire civilization. So sand is beautiful, we all know, growing up on the beach as I did, uh, I knew how beautiful it looked, shining gold in the sunset, shining silver in the moonlight and watching all the creatures which use it, whether they are crabs digging up holes in the sand where they live and scattering sand in these wonderful shapes all across an expansive beach or it's the shells which walk on the sand, each one leaving their own particular kind of trail crisscrossing over each other and it creating patterns, flowers in the sand or whether it's the sea as it washes into the sand and you hear its sound and you lie down and you touch the sand. It's beautiful and we all depend on beaches for our holidays. But sand has other uses too and it's only man who leaves behind the ugly footprint of taking sand away in huge mounds and craters. When migratory birds use the sand, they leave their light footprints on the sand which are washed away. And when sand is also used by fish for breeding by mangroves which grow in sand by all kinds of living beings but man takes away the sand and why does he do this? He does this because our entire built civilization is built on sand. Sand is the material which we use to make cement and concrete. It gives cement and concrete its particular qualities of strength because sand is, comes to us from the mountains over many many years washed down, crowned bits of stone, churned by the sea, churned by the river and sand is also formed of shells which I, we see living walking on the sea, on the, on the beach but sand is churned up, those same shells are churned up by the tides, they wash in, they wash out and this is why when I first said to, when I noticed sand being taken away and I realized how important this sand is to me and how important it is not to let my beach get destroyed and I went and complained and I was told that go home look after your children because sand is inexhaustible it's the very definition of plenty as plentiful as grains of sand as plentiful as stars of the sky this is how plenty is defined and it keeps coming back so if you dig a little bit of sand it's fine it, there'll be more there'll always be more but I also realized when I tried to stop it and I was attacked that in fact it's so insignificant, so cheap, so easily available that nobody really cares about it. But it's also important enough that somebody would attack me, want to kill me to, because they, this sand is so important. So I filed the first public interest litigation and in the course of that litigation discovered in 2010, a decade ago, when nobody was really talking about sustainable economy, about recycling, about uh, circular economy, that I met, I was fortunate, I met Professor Shama Sulekar of the IIT Bombay, who presented a paper and explained to me how we could have substitutes for sand, which would actually be able to reduce some of the burden on our beaches, on our rivers, on our creeks. And this substitute that he talked about at that time was mainly construction and demolition waste or debris, which of course already contains sand and could be crushed and reused to substitute aggregate. In the decades since then, it has become clear that the sand does have a mafia, that the attack on me was not an isolated incident. In 2012, I presented to the UN for the first time when they had their Convention of Biodiversity in India about sand mining and people were surprised. Everyone I spoke to said, it has never occurred to us that sand mining is an issue. All the coastal issues and coastal biodiversity is among the most important issues that we have, that we take up. So since 2012, 
In 2014, Dr. Pascal Peduzzi wrote his first paper for the UN, for the UNEP on sand mining. And later, he, he is now the, now heads the Grid Geneva of the United Nations Environment Programme. In 2018, he held the first round table on sand, which documented internationally how trade in sand happens. But before that, in the same year, 2012, when I was presenting to the UN, I also participated in the first documentary film on sand, made by my friend Dennis Delistrack and which the UN watched and which many other people watched and had the same reaction that we didn't know that sand was this important issue. Sand was, the film was called, and it's important and it's very um, clear that the name was as important as the term sand mafia which I coined because the sand mafia attacks people who prevent sand mining and sand was talks of the fact that wars are typically the place where nations fight over boundaries. Sand is extracted from weaker countries, from the borders of weaker countries and reduces their, their border sometimes and it is exported illegally very often to countries which are more economically able to buy the sand and is used in reclamation which actually expands their borders. So sand is being used as a medium of trade and it's being used to change and redefine national borders and therefore the power equation of the world in general. I knew it was important to present this to the UN and I wrote again to the UN asking them to include it in their political agenda. But this only happened in 2018 when Dr. Pascal Veduzzi held the very first round table on sand internationally, invited me to speak, which I was very honored to do to present how sand mining became important in India, how over the last two decades since the attack on me, the attacks have multiplied and intensified about my representations to the government of my state, Maharashtra, and to the national government of India to tell them why sand mining is important, why sand mining is not regulated in spite of the fact that their own government officers, hundreds of government officers, police officers in the last decade have been either attacked or murdered. So it isn't just people like me who interfere in sand mining who are attacked and murdered from the outside. It's people who actually control the trade, who are confident enough that they can, they can actually um, ha attack use violence against even the authorities. In spite of this, it was only in 2016 that the government of India came up with the Sustainable Sand Mining Guidelines, where they again put the burden of reg regulating sand back to the local district level officers who were themselves under threat. It took until 2020, January of 2000, this year, before the government of India recognized officially that there is a mafia. And in the meantime, since the government has neither tracked the supply or demand of sand, they have declared that India's GDP growth is going to catch up with the West by building and that we are going to build the equivalent of a new Chicago every year to catch up with the West. So we are learning from the mistakes of the West and that cement concrete building has actually contributed to climate change, contributed to the effects of, of uh, sea level rise, contributed to the to groundwater depletion by cutting off the uh, ground itself from percolation of rain and other, ground, other waters into the level in a country like India where droughts are a problem. This is a huge problem. We have not learned those lessons. In fact, we have not done the studies in spite of having technological capabilities to match anyone else in the world of satellite tracking, of IT-enabled tracking from the, from the point of extraction through the whole travel of sand to the point of use. Government is the largest builder of all. It builds infrastructure, roads, all this is built by government. If they chose to take it up sincerely, if they chose to take up the issue of sand mining and say that they will, while announcing any new infrastructure building project, they will track where the sand comes from, whether it is illegally extracted, track it through its point of 
travel and to the point of use, the solutions would be easy. But the government has not tracked this for us. The government has left it to people like Dr. Shama Sulekar, who has worked with his PhD students at IIT Bombay over the last decade and quantified for us what is the requirement of sand in India and what the substitutes could be. Uh, he, his research data shows that to fulfill India's entire need and its GDP growth, we will require 60 million metric tons per year of sand or sand substitute. He has also discovered, uh, building on to his paper of 2010, he has also discovered that we have the resources because we have the resources are part of something that we consider garbage, that we consider waste. It's lying in our legacy dumps. He has quantified the amount of raw material available in our legacy dumps at 1200 metric million metric tons a year. So we have a 60 million metric ton a year requirement of sand. We have 1200 million metric tons a year of availability of garbage, which includes construction and demolition waste. It includes other materials which can be recycled, such as metals and industrial wastes. And it also includes plastic. Plastic is a huge environmental hazard in its own right, recognized by the UN as one of the biggest challenges that we face uh, in, cons in conserving biodiversity. India has pioneered technology where we have proved that plastic can be used as a substitute for sand and aggregate in building roads. There are at least two industrial townships which have used roads, used plastic in road construction and have, have demonstrated that plastic roads are longer lasting, stronger, smoother and generally better than roads which are conventionally made. We have the technology, we have the raw materials, we have the requirement and we have the, the passion among our youth to be able to do this, to be able to implement these things. Whether they come from any sector at all, our youth have stood up for clim against climate change, they have petitioned the government, they have done it online, they have done it offline, they have done it through their involvement with the various sectors they want to build careers in, whether those sectors are in technology, in IT, in um, business, there's a huge role for business in uh, creating these kind of technological shifts. When I was young, we believed the world will stop without the use of coal and oil. We did not know that that day will come when I will be able to say that I would like solar panels on my house, that I would like to have a house which is not, does not use coal and oil, which does not destroy the environment. It was very expensive to start with, of course, because coal and oil is what we knew. Our entire infrastructure was built around it and it took a while to mainstream. It took people working in different streams to, be, to make that happen, to make it techno-economically feasible. Dr. Shama Sodeka's research has found that recycling of garbage of various kinds into aggregate to substitute sand is techno-economically feasible. What we need is the will of the government, of the private sector, of business models, of students, of people in diverse fields to recognize that sand is something that is beautiful, that we need to conserve. It's not only beautiful, it supports life. It supports life of so many different types. The government of India and the minister of the um, Ministry of Environment recognized at some point that sand is India's new gold because it drives, because whether we live in the city or we live in the, by a river or we live by a sea, we are surrounded by sand and we'd rather be surrounded by that sand which is beautiful and useful than that sand which we use to build concrete structures, break up, demolish, rebuild, throw it away destroying our environment. We have recognized this, we have recognized this as sand mafia, we have finally recognized that there is a way we can reuse a garbage and waste to substitute sand. The UN has said that India and China which use more sand in the last decade than the West used in the entire 20th century have the capability 
of leading the world in both finding these new technologies and mainstreaming them so that they become the norm and not something which is very expensive to use or very difficult to use. Let's do this together. I believe that all of us together can make this happen. We can make sand mining, it's the second most extractive material in the world after water. We can make it something which is obsolete because we can be proud to have houses which are built out of garbage. I know young people today like to have show off the fact that they use shoes made out of plastic and clothes made out of plastic, out of recycled plastic, that we like to show that we are conscious of what's happening around us, that we control our carbon miles, that we contribute in various ways. I would like to see the day when I'm able to say, I would like a house which is not built out of sand. I would like a house and I'm proud that I live in a house which is built out of something that in years past was called garbage, was destructive to the environment and today it is useful and it is giving us so much more and we are leaving our beaches, our rivers, our creeks intact for our future generations to enjoy the way we have enjoyed them. Lying in the sand, watching the moon, watching the sunset, looking at the crabs, welcoming migratory birds. Thank you very much. This sand is our sand.